Hi, everybody. Welcome to this installment of the Michael and Rusty Show. I'm Rusty Harrison. And as usual, I have my co-host, uh, Michael Willoughby, my nephew. And we're going to talk today about the uh, recent playoff series with the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Florida Panthers. Leafs were eliminated in five games. And we're going mm -hmm. to see uh, what the outlook is for the Leafs roster and front office. And uh, Michael, of course, is a very big Leaf fan, if you've been following our mm -hmm. programs. Uh, I am less so, but I am always a fascinated uh, observer of the Toronto Maple Leafs. So, uh, first of all, uh, hi, Michael. Hey, Uncle Wes. So, let's start with your overall assessment of the Leafs playoff uh, series and uh, what you think uh, has to happen in the uh, coming weeks. Well, my first thought is, thank God that we got out of the first round for the first time since I was in grade, I think it was grade, I was in grade 10 or grade 11 at Sir yeah. Arnold Gap. That was the last time the Leafs uh, advanced to the second round. And I think it was years. Eddie Belfour was the uh, was the was the goaltender at that time. Yeah, and I think Pat Quinn was the head coach. Yeah, so that explains a lot of the uh, animosity towards uh, between excuse me between the Leafs fans and the uh, the Leafs management yeah. uh, for for the most part almost twenty years. So I was very glad when. John Tavares scored the winning goal in Game Six, uh, to in overtime to beat the, at one point the reigning and defending Stanley Cup champions, in one of the most uh, highly uh, respectable franchises in the last several years in the NHL and the Tampa yeah. Bay Lightning. And I remember I was watching it with my friends at the house. And they live not too far from Tim Hortons Field in downtown Hamilton. We all, like, erupted uh, with uh, with sheer uh, joy. And, yeah, it was, it was, I was glad that I had the big monkey off the back. But at the same time, when you looked at uh, the Boston Florida round one series, round one series, and I, Really thought it was going to be Boston that was going to beat Florida, yeah. but they left they left the guard down and uh, they had an opportunity that, that uh, by uh, I think it was uh, Brad Marchand breakaway in Game Six I believe or Game Five, yeah, and that they could have sealed the series, but uh, Boston was the grand definition of a choke hazard now because of what happened in the playoffs, given the fact they won 65 games in the yep. regular season, best in NHL history in an 82-game schedule. And uh, so there was a sense of optimism that, okay, now the Florida Panthers was the Detroit, well, excuse me, was the, the Toronto opponent, opponent for next round. And maybe, just maybe, the, the Maple Leafs would have gone to the conference final, but Ultimately, uh, as we all know, they lost the uh, the other night to Florida in Game Five, and it well, was a controversy, controversial uh, game by all means. But controversy aside, I just thought you know I was in peace that the Maple Leafs were going to the second round, and with the core that we have, it which we're gonna talk about. Shortly, the Florida Panthers, uh, you gotta give them full marks. Uh, they they just uh, stymied the the Toronto uh, offense, especially uh, uh, Matthews, uh, Tavares, uh, Neil Andrew, to just I think four points, no goals, yeah. four points in five games. And I'll talk about more of them in, in a little bit, but yeah, it was just. It was a sign of optimism, but I think for the fan standpoint, it was too much optimism when they won in Florida 
not all the fans in in in, in Toronto, but I was leaning towards I said, you know what, a more realistic path would be Toronto going through Florida instead of Toronto going through Boston because we all know the previous history. But yeah. I wouldn't mind Boston if they would have uh, hold on and win the series. Well, I think right against Florida. I think that they match up better, ironically, with Boston. Mm. But uh, there, there was some psychological issue that was causing them to uh, not perform well. Yeah. Um, growing up, I mean, a good example of this would be, again, using Boston, I would say the New York Rangers in the uh, for for the majority of the 1970s actually had problems with Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one series that they did win, but uh, you know, Boston had their number historically. And I think you can say that with um, you know what what we saw over the years between Toronto and Boston in, in this decade, um, you know the 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 whole history of of uh, collapses, the game seven I believe it was two thousand fourteen, was it two thousand fourteen? I think so. I remember. Yeah, that it was. Well. It was in that range anyway. Um, you know where they they came back. Uh, Boston came back from a three goal deficit in game seven to win in overtime. Um, you know those those are those are hard lessons. And I think that Florida, um, you know, like I think Florida is a slower team than Boston. But I think that Florida was far more intense in terms of their forechecking game. Boston, I think, is a better positional team. I think they're better on the counterattack in general. But Florida, I think they gave Toronto fits with their forechecking. Mm -hmm. And and of course they did as well with Boston. Uh, that's why Boston got eliminated. They couldn't handle the four check. Um, when you look at the way the the series developed, uh, when did you think that Toronto really lost the series? I think I, I believe it was game. Game three? Yeah, it was out of two ways. One was out of game three, uh, that wrap around and fall yeah. to and then we we're gonna talk about rolling just uh just a sec, but uh, he I thought he played uh, pretty good, uh, very commendable to 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 be honest. Yeah. But the defense and let alone the compete level of the Maple Leafs in that game was dry. Yeah. Was very bad. Was I don't say very bad, but very below average for a team that that professed on a strong offense and uh, and a good enough defense to and goaltending to uh, carry the take this team to the uh, the Stanley Cup. Well, I I think that you know you could look at Tavares as an example. He's getting paid a lot of money. Yeah, he's the captain of the team. And I think that he his effort was there. I I never saw I never saw him as a real liability when he was out there. Mm -hmm. But he's not he's he's like a point of point of game guy. He's not the guy that is expected to be the dominant player or players of that mm -hmm. roster. You know, he's a glue guy. Yeah. And I think that for me, uh you know, like you, you could argue, okay, Matthews didn't score a goal in the Florida series. But for me, the, the problem guy was Mitch Varner. Yeah. He was absolutely brutal in most of those games. He got a goal in the in the fourth game, helped yeah. help Toronto extend the series. But the constant uh turnovers, the one turnover that he made, I believe it was in uh game three where they basically took the puck from uh him behind the goal line and yeah. proceeded to put it in the net um you know just things like this it it was 
really a problem that Toronto he, had throughout the series. Yeah, he was a Toronto machine. Yeah. Uh, as the as we uh, both fans of the Chizzo Adonis uh, of YouTube uh, channel, that Chizzo Adonis himself will call it uh, got Apple turnovers, and yeah. boy, Mitch Motto gave gave Panthers uh, Apple turnovers more yeah. than a uh, fair share. And one thing to touch uh, on my other point is the other game was I think that. That led to the Leafs losing the series was that controversial no goal in Game Five. Uh, despite the fact that it was in real time, and a lot of people on Twitter are uh, like trying to spin spin this uh, thing to to the to the never ending degree that the puck dick the uh, Bob. Bobrovsky, I can't pronounce Bobrovsky. The last. Just call Bobrovsky. him Bobrovsky. does. Well, Bob. Yeah. Uh, Pat got in, got touched with the with the puck before it, uh, it increased, but uh, it is what it is. It yeah. was a very much of a. It was, it was a foregone conclusion. I liked how the 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 official the 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 uh, the people behind the uh, the goal. Video uh, took, even though it took about nearly ten minutes, roughly ten yeah. minutes. It, it's it was a very very, you know, uh, it was a, it was a right call. There was it. no it was look. There was no fix. I mean, yeah. I've read some stuff online that it was a fix. Okay, yeah. and let's be clear. Toronto is a money machine for the NHL. Yeah. If there's any Canadian team that would be uh, favored by the NHL to make money in a playoff series, get a playoff run to the Stanley Cup final or, you know, to win the cup, it'd be Toronto. Yeah. So for me, you have to look at the fact in that replay that it, it just by the way Bobrovsky was moving, it looked like, okay, he, he was trying to get back to, uh, you know, back on his feet basically and was moving mm-hmm. around. So obviously the puck dropped and you, you know, you could say by the angle, okay, it dropped behind the line. But the fact is, is that from all the multiple shots, you know, you, you can't say that, that there was a definitive look early in the, in the process that mm-hmm. definitively said, okay, the, the, it's a goal. So mm-hmm. for me, it was like one of those things where, you know, it, 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 if anything, the call on the ice would have to stand. There was no definitive you know, early entry of the puck into the net. So that's one of those things where, you know, they, they, they have a chip in the puck now. I think it, you know, I, I've heard uh, other other podcasters have said this, and I agree. Um, there should be a development of the technology so that you can definitively say, okay, the puck is over the line. Mm-hmm. You know, like you have it in tennis, you have it in soccer. They have to develop it so that you can have, uh, you know, a, a, a pretty good indication that yes, the puck is over the line. You know, to take that away from, um, you know, this being a, uh, you know, half the time we see the the camera angles and you only see the back of the goalie and you see his butt, right? You don't see mm-hmm. the, the the actual. Uh, puck on the on the line itself, and and they should be doing something to change that. I think, mm-hmm. you know, uh, in terms of uh, the refereeing, in in not just not just the series that we you know we're talking about tonight with the Leafs, but overall, uh, what do you think of the overall refereeing going on? Like uh, the entire NHL? Yeah, in general. Yeah. There's some questionable spots, but at the end of the day, I've always stated this about refereeing, whether it's at the, the NHL, OHL, or any sports leagues that we we know, 
referees are human beings and it, you have to make a decision on real time yeah. and uh, you have to have a proper judgment and there has been cases that there has been improper judgment in uh, in games it's not just NHL but uh, other uh, games as well in the past like for instance we go back to the CFL in I believe it was 2014 in Vancouver uh, the, the great cup there when that Brandon Banks uh, touchdown was was yeah. nullified against because, Calgary. Yeah, yeah, against Calgary. Uh, but the second look, there was not only the uh, the Taylor Reed uh, penalty, but there was also an offsetting penalty that was missed, I believe, by uh, by a special team from Calgary. Yeah, that could have like. You know, could have gone away for well, a by, touchdown. Well, by, so. by football rules, if there's offsetting penalties, it still nullifies the play. That's the problem. Yeah. But I agree with you, like, on that one. Um, for me, the more egregious one was the actual overtime goal that's, that decided the series where you saw Gudis hold the stick of the Leaf defender. Yeah. Uh, that allowed the lane for Cousins to, sh- to shoot. Uh, I think that that was a missed call. And it... You know, I I think if you remember after the meltdown that we had with uh, the the Sharks and the Golden Knights, I believe it was four years ago, that, uh, you know, five-minute power play that changed the course of the series and, you know, the the final game. Um, the, the, The league wanted to take a look at overtime goals more uh, seriously. Yeah. I think that they should be saying that that the overtime goals have to be viewed for penalties such as the interference that that didn't get called. Mm-hmm. I, I don't I don't necessarily think you have to do it for every goal, but for a series a series deciding goal, you know, in particular, uh, I I think that that has to be taken into account. Mm-hmm. You know, so that that's something that you know we'll we'll see how it develops in the rest of the playoffs. But refereeing has always been a problem in the NHL between uh, what's called in the regular season and what's allowed mm-hmm. in the playoffs. So you know, I I I think we're going to be talking about that for all the remaining series. You know, what do you think about the future of the core four? Uh, Matthews, Tavares. Neilander and I think Riley or Marner. Well, Marner, and then of course you have Riley as like the fifth guy. Yeah. So the future is uh, could be no bigger. Well, let's just say. Let me go back to what I say the the future of the core four will will really be tested in July because. From what I've heard about uh, Matthews, as one Blaine said, they, they want they want to pick up a a, a contract, uh, like extend the contract now before yeah. the season. Uh, given the fact that Neil Ander is, um, excuse me, uh, Matthews. Sorry, I didn't drink a lot of water on this before no recording problem. the podcast, but the thing is about Matthews. Uh, this guy has been Tim Tebow in the postseason in a large part. Not like every single game, but in large part, he was awful uh, to to the point, even though he had many quality starts on several games here and there. But Matthews was was, uh, just like uh, Mono and um, Tavares. They have been anemic. Nylander, yeah. to me, of all those four guys, yeah. is the most interesting guy and the one that would be the hardest for me as a hockey fan to let go. Because yeah. at any time, he takes over a game. He reminds me a lot of uh, Alex Kovalev. It's not to say that you can rely on that guy, but he is... You know, he 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 single handedly scored that goal 
uh, to tie the game in game five. Yeah. And I think that um, his contract is the easiest one to move because it's yeah. just under $7 million. There has uh, been word about uh, Neil and uh, some fan from the Calgary Flames. Yeah. Said something that's about his dad, his dad from... played for the Flames. Yeah. Uh, in Johnny Hockey's uh, podcast, he was mentioning this, and it, it's it's a good point. You know, the thing is, is that um, Matthews's contract right now is eleven point six four million. I, I I have the uh, cap friendly chart on the yeah. other monitor. Um, you know, like that that's a really big contract to move. Mm-hmm. He's going to be asking for like fourteen million, I would think. Yeah, if he it, 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 he's a top three guy now, but he's the guy with the next contract because I think I I think I'm I'm trying to remember if McDavid is the next year. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah, because he's going to he's going to set the market. The next year. He's going to set the market, and the yeah. thing is, to me. Tim Tebow had a great game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Let's not forget. Yes, okay. I'm I'm a, I'm a I'm a Raider fan, so I can I can drop a bomb on Tebow. It's not a, not an issue. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, um, Matthews, you, you can't argue that with Connor McDavid. McDavid and Drysaitel they show up. The problem is, is that they didn't have enough depth mm-hmm. in their second second line or their third line. It, like yeah. their 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 whole their whole um, stat sheet is like a lifesaver. There's a big hole in the middle, right? But Drysaitel had an incredible uh, playoffs, you know. Yes. And I mean, their power play is is sublime. It's it's like arguably the best I've ever seen, right? But the thing is that uh, Matthews has big issues in terms of whether he can dominate he can take over a game. Yeah. And unless they have somebody riding shotgun with him that can create space, it's not going to happen. M- Michael Bunting is not that guy. I'm sorry. Evander Kane can do that with the Oilers on the top line with, with dry, uh, McDavid and Dreisaitl, right? Mm. They have to have somebody who, if not creates fear, creates distraction and, and just gets in people's faces. The yeah. Leafs don't have that. And and you have to have that like Matthew Kachuk to me would make my life miserable if I was a star player. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem with the Leafs. Ryan O'Reilly was that guy that they tried to get. He's a great player. He's not yeah. that guy. He's not the guy who's going to create space for the other. You know, he's he's a defensive shutdown guy. He's a two hundred yeah. foot guy. Every time I see Matthews go into corner and and try to butt check the 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 other player, not put a shoulder in or anything like that, it just yeah. drives me nuts. And I'm not even a Leaf fan. <laughs> I don't know about Marner. John Tavares at least will muck it up a bit. Yeah. Nylander, I don't think anybody ever expects him to do that. But at least he gives it a go. He can make some he can get some turnovers, right? Yeah. For 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 a top four group. They've been the most disappointing I've seen in years. Yeah, this was with uh, this. The, the, yeah, just a quick, like a quick point about that. Yeah, this was the the most tough to watch uh, than any other season, any other playoff run, because there was so so high the expectations were so high. For those for those guys, and they they uh, they couldn't bother to uh, to get an antidote and be the driving force that they they're entitled to have uh, based on their salary. 
Yeah, I, I think Keith should be fired. Mm-hmm. Dubas, I think, is worth keeping if yeah. he makes trades. I don't know what they'll do with Shanahan because he's been there too long for no results. Yeah. And I'm a Red Wing fan, as you know, so I love I love Shanahan. Yeah. But they've got big issues, and Keefe is the biggest issue for me. Yeah. Um, you cannot play a possession game and not be able to consistently drive through and score. Yeah. They have no forechecking game. That's consistent. No. They don't make enough turnovers in the uh, neutral zone. Quite often during the season, they're they're capitalizing on uh, breaks, and mm-hmm. it's e- far easier, of course, to 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 uh, make uh, odd man rushes from your end in the regular season. But they it doesn't translate to playoff hockey. No. Noel Acharty, I think, is one of the best pickups that they've made. And he's not, he doesn't have the top end talent to translate into being a a playoff guy. Mm -hmm. But he's going to work his ass off every shift. He's going to be in someone's face every shift. I respect that. I I respect uh, uh, the 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 newcomer late in the season late season newcomer uh, nice. nice Matthew he, Nice he was, Matthew Nice he was really really good for the uh, for the Leafs uh, like, in this short time like they, they like they said right um uh, like um I forget I don't know if it was on the Sportsnet telecast but there you know there were people talking about this. And a number, a number of shows were talking about this, and I agree that he is the type of guy that would be he'd be an improvement over Bunting for sure, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But again, he's not. He would be a guy like I could see him being a top six guy if his offensive potential that I've heard about, you know, develops. He could be a top six guy. He could be. He could be a second liner for sure. Yeah, he's definitely an improvement in terms of of the playoff effort. Because because they've, um, I'm trying to think like it would be like Pittsburgh, it would like be be like Pittsburgh after Ron Francis, uh, retired. Uh, Kevin Stevens left, you know, in in the mid to late uh, '90s when it was uh, still uh, Lemieux and Yager, right. Mm-hmm. They got soft. They yeah. really did. And you can't you can't win with top end talent unless you have some 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 glue. Yeah. You know, like if you played 1980s hockey with Wayne Gretzky and Yuri Curry, yeah, you had Dave Semenko on your on your uh top line a lot. But in key situations, it was Messier, it was Anderson, it was guys that were constantly in your face, constantly driving, going to the net. And that's the biggest thing about the Toronto Maple Leafs. When I was, uh, you know, when I when I was seeing all the success that Detroit had under Mike Babcock, net front presence, that was always talked about, going to the net. This team does not going to go to the net enough. They simply don't get to the uh, spaces where you score. Yeah, it's a. Like it's the, a the, the more they're trying to be more finesse than anything else. It. How many times in the series did you see Wall or Samsonov comfortable going out of the net, having you know having a defenseman? Uh, seal a guy off very little TJ Brody disappointed me 
-hmm. Like he was inconsistent. I thought Riley was head and shoulders above any of their defensemen. Yeah, he, if if the Leafs would have been gone all the way to the cult, uh, not say cult, but to the Stanley Cup, and yeah. I think Riley would have been an early favorite to win the Conn Smythe because for sure, th- this guy he was, their was best unbelievable. Player. He was their best player, and I mean, all the attacks to me, you know, and I, I watched so many Leaf games growing up, right. Um, I wouldn't compare him to Borea Salming in terms of talent, in terms of impact that he had mm-hmm. on the game. But it's a similar story in terms of just the abuse that Salming got from a lot of people. Just a lot, a lot of uh, you know, uh prejudiced comments about Europeans back in the day, right? Yeah. But it's a similar story in terms of the, just the recognition that people give him now as a player on their team, as a leader on their team. He should be the captain. Mm-hmm. Like, like past, you know, the next one after Tavares, he should be the captain, I think. Yeah, the way that he addressed the, the, addressed the, uh, the media after the press conferences – Especially yeah. the one uh, today, uh, the locker room cleanup. Uh, he, he loves, he likes the group, but he also he also mentioned that uh, he wants Scott Dubas to remain as GM. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I don't know if it's a exact quote from Matthew Riley, uh, Morgan Riley, excuse me. Um, he did mention to say that at the end of the day, we. We uh, the, the at the end of the day, the play players uh, the results came from the players, not from the. Uh... He took responsibility. Yeah, Mitch Marner throughout the playoffs. Whenever things went wrong, whenever he was asked by the media, he either said we don't listen to you, or he he deflected. And you cannot win cups with guys that deflect. Yeah. I don't care what it what position they play. I don't care where where they're situated. Except if you're getting paid north of $10 million in today's NHL. And you're literally you're making more turnovers on drop back passes at the blue line, at the opposing blue line, than you have assists. Mm-hmm. And you're a hundred point producer for your team. Yeah. I I think that if he went to another team, and it's been said by other people, but I absolutely agree. If he goes to another team, he could be a megastar. Yep. But with with the people that he plays with, his game is weak. Absolute weak sauce. In the playoffs, when he's facing down, hard for checking. Hard yeah, for checking. Yeah, I read a uh, quick note. I remember... Uh, when Mitch Mono was with the London Knights, and he and you said about star quality, uh, like a superstar, yeah. he was the London Knights uh, driving force. Like he scored goals, he was a, a major point producer, leading the Knights to the yeah. the uh, uh, Memorial Cup uh, back in twenty fifteen, I believe twenty sixteen. Yeah, he. But who's the coach? The uh, Hunter. I know, and he and if you follow the the London Knights, uh, especially the last fifteen years, you know how what kind of a coach uh, Dale Hunter it was. Yeah, it is he, he's he's a he's a hard nose, no nonsense kind of coach that will give you the an earful if you make yeah. make bad plays. He's, a, he's that's why he's one of the, the best coaches in the history of the OHL. Yeah. 
you you cannot you cannot do this year after year and expect a different yeah. result. At a certain point in Toronto, in Montreal, I wouldn't say Vancouver because they, they've just had a terrible history, but Montreal and Toronto in particular. Yeah. You cannot do this year after year and expect yeah. it to work. It never does. You know, like like uh Turk Broda, Terry Sachuk, Johnny Bauer, they're not walking into that dressing room tomorrow. No. They don't have a playoff goalie that can steal games. Belfour probably I, I would say would was the last one. Yeah. And 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 this wasn't even peak Belfour. Curtis Joseph, same thing. Right? Yeah. They have issues. And they they have to deal with they have to uh you know I think that there's going to be a a shakeup for sure. And it's probably going to be Keith. Yeah. He's just gone. Yeah. He, they, they should have had a Pat Burns uh kind of coaching in, in this kind of series because he from what I've heard in this in the history. He he was a nonsense coach, a no nonsense coach, and he would he will toughen you guys up, and that's what the the Leafs should be getting uh, in the next cut head coach. So, from what we've been talking about, there are tons of questions. One one aspect that came up in the last couple of games that I think uh, you know I'd like to get your input on is the uh, the way Joseph Wall played coming in uh, to replace uh, Ilya Samsonov. Uh, how how do you feel about his uh, performance and uh, what do you see his future as being? I believe he has a shot of cracking the starting roster next year. Uh, the way that he played, the way he composed himself was really good. Uh, it seemed that uh, every time they, there was a challenge, Florida was throwing at him. I think Joseph Wall was really uh, capable to live up to the task. That uh, this literally uh, a need still in goaltending. Uh, uh, like you mentioned earlier, that the Leafs do not have a playoff goalie. A goalie in the that's capable of performing in the playoffs since uh Belfort and earlier than that it was Chris Joseph. Yeah. But uh if Joseph Wall gets more neutral uh in the Marley's organization with the Toronto Marley's as they are now in the North Division final as we speak, yeah. This this guy should get a lot of reps. Uh, for the for the Marlies in the coming uh, games or so, if he does go back to the Marlies, which I think he will, but nevertheless, I think Wall, given his uh, short uh, statue uh, with in the postseason and in the regular season too, he is he won a hand, handful of games too. Uh, I think he should get a, get a crack at the starting lineup. I don't know about the starting. Man, mind a role, but it's just it's just up to what the Leafs organization, uh, the brain trust there, wh- wh- whoever will be uh, after the going to camp, like after yeah. the off season. Like I, I, think I could Roll's see, gonna get a, I think Roll should get should get a look, but I do think they do need to get uh, a a goaltender that has playoff experience. Uh, Sans, that's no fault to Samson Alvino because Samson Alvino played uh, his butt off in round one. And then in round two, he was, it was, it came up uh, well short because of the uh, the freak injury. Yeah, like I, I, I don't I don't think that uh, from what I saw of Samson off, like my my initial feelings about him, um, I I was skeptical. And they actually mm-hmm. played pretty well overall, yeah. I would say. But he, I don't think he was a, 
I don't think he was a, a, a difference maker. I think that's no. fair to say. Um, he had his moments in the Tampa series for sure. Um, I think that Wall strikes me as a guy who's kind of like in the Mike Leute mold. He plays pretty quietly. Uh, his size is a big advantage over most goalies. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I see potential. You know, he's not Justin Pogge. No. Just from the eye test. I've I saw a couple games that he played during the regular season. Uh everything I've I've seen out of the AHL this year, plus uh obviously the playoff sample that we saw. Mm-hmm. So I think that there's potential there for sure. Yeah. What I want to finish on is just to get your comments on on the the general the gist of what uh, Kyle Dubas said at his press conference today. First of all, saying that no no trade can be excluded if it gets the Leafs closer to the Stanley Cup. Mm. And also that it's too early uh, to make a definitive uh, move on Sheldon Keefe's future. But it's clear that he's not ruling it out. Mm. How do you feel about... Um, just generally what came out of the Keefe uh, discussion today? My thought is, is that Dubas is saying the right stuff, but it's more of him have to be more proactive uh, with, with all phases of personnel on the ice. And that has to start with the head coach. Is he confident that uh, Sheldon Key can still uh, rally the troops and uh, put together a lengthy run next year? Uh, as it states right now, Dubas's contract is up. I do think he is going to get resigned. Uh, it, this this guy has done everything that he possibly can. And then some for the Toronto Maple Leafs. He dealt at a tough hand when when he uh, handled the the backup situation because I think he he did a, a he done his prudence uh, with experience uh, getting getting uh, you know. Uh, a guy that's very familiar with uh, Kyle Dubas back in the OHL in Sault Ste. Marie and, and uh, Sheldon Keefe, who was at the time coaching the Marlies. Yeah. And, but that did not pan out because of the uh, subsequent exits, and exception for, of course, the, the this past playoffs. I would like to say they should get an experienced head coach like um, – uh, and I would say call a, a Boudreau, like a Bruce Boudreau kind of kind of guy. They you have Gallant. Gallant. I don't know. I don't know if the Rangers would uh, release him um, yeah. to talk to the Leafs. But you have Gallant. You have Laviolette. You mm. have some. You have some established coaches. Uh, I know for sure they're not going back to Babcock. No, but. Um, Boudreaux is a player's coach. Mm-hmm. He gets a, sh- a short-term bounce everywhere he's been. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't think that his approach translates to the playoffs. Mm-hmm. They need a defensive coach. Mm-hmm. Or at least a coach that can create a system. Yeah. That works with Dubas if he is indeed going to make some changes that get some speed, particularly, I would argue, back on defense. They need more guys that can move the puck. And they need to have, uh, again, I don't know if Samsonov's the answer, but they do need to upgrade uh, in goaltending. I think Wall at, least, Wall at least could be the backup. Yeah. But I, 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 
defense right. took a notch with with uh, the injury of Muzzin and uh, yeah. Giordano I mean, if, and... if you had Muzzin, if you had Muzzin from five years ago, they 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 could still be playing. They could they could win. Yeah. But Jake Jake Muzzin's just he's just had such a a, a bad experience with injuries, and you know, mm-hmm. it's age is age. Yes. You know, and um. I think that this is this is a big problem for the Leafs. They yeah. have to recast their their the way the cap is distributed on their team, and they had I I do think that they have to uh, break up this core. Mm-hmm. And if it's just keeping two guys, then it's just keeping two guys. But I I, I do think that uh, you know if if I had to keep one of them, I would keep Matthews mm. uh, over Marner. But we'll see. Marner Marner's contract is easier to keep, you know. I have been a Maple Leafs fan since the ninety eight ninety nine season, yeah. and I have gone to. I have watched. Uh, um, was it Daniel Bowen, Jim Bowen? Like now, said it on on uh, on Sportsnet, TSN. And later on on radio, and it it was always glad to want to hear a Jim Bowen's voice, and he's now looks like he is planning for retirement or right. the land on departure from the Leafs, which is a sh- kind of a shame uh, to an extent. And also, let's not forget about the Maple Leafs uh, drought with the with the Stanley Cup. There's been fifty six years and counting, and I would love to see the Leafs win it once in a lifetime. And I thought this group was, for the most to to a good degree, was going to get it done, but they did, they couldn't strike off the bad playoff fives. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I just think. They need to have a complete uh, overhaul of management if, and only if, the Maple Leafs do not go deep in the playoffs next year. At the very least, like uh, Dubas should get a, a thin, should be in, should be in a thin leash. I do think, as I pointed out, I think, and you also pointed out, about uh, Sean and Keith uh, getting the axe, mm-hmm. I think he is going to go, and they we we should bring, we should change the culture. The culture yeah. needs to be shaken up because it is still a recycling mode. The, the Maple Leafs are still in the recycling mode every single year, and until we get a, a consistent track record going, and that is going into deep in the playoffs. And into the Stanley Cup, which we have not had the closest thing since 1993. The 93 team, which was coached by Pat Burns, was one game away. Orlando, one goal away, had not been for uh, the Gretzky slash that should have been called. We could have had a Toronto Montreal Stanley Cup, and who knows? Yeah. Toronto would have won the Cup. Again, again, I'm not, I'm not. A Leaf fan like you are, yeah. But they had home ice in Game Seven, yeah. and they let them off the hook. Yeah. The biggest problem Toronto has is that Toronto Maple Leaf Gardens, since 1967, I was a year and a half old. Mm-hmm. Toronto has never had uh, a fortress. No. Boston Garden, when the Bruins have had their success, it's been a fortress. Yeah. Montreal Forum, it was a fortress. Yeah. Uh, Julius Arena for the Wings, many, many years. Best uh, home record. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to have a base. Yeah, and if you're if you're, you know, you you have two series, you win five games, and you only win one game at home. 
it's a problem. You go all the through the entire year to get home advantage. And the only big clutch thing you can really point to that everybody remembers was only what two and a half weeks ago. Yeah. And it was on the road. They have to impose their will. The only way you can get Leaf Nation to get behind that team. And look, you know, I, I, I grew up in Hamilton. Most of my life I was in Ontario. The Leafs fans are dying for a for a winner. Yep. You're dying for a winner. Yep. And when the Leaf fans are excited, it's an amazing experience. Even if you're paying five hundred dollars for the best seats, well, the the best seats in the top, you know, the top deck. But you know, it to me, it just the only way you translate into being a success in, in playoff hockey. Ultimately, you have to have clutch goaltending that pulls out games that you shouldn't win at least once or twice in the, in the run. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have guys that consistently show up throughout the lineup. And really you have to have depth scoring. That's a big, big factor. And the Leafs simply didn't have it. Mm -hmm. And they haven't had it in years. People used to, people used to criticize um, the team in the seventies. People used to criticize the Sundin days of the of the uh, late nineties and early two thousands. Again, I'm not a Leaf fan, but those teams had grit, and those teams did show up in the playoffs. They weren't successful, and and you know we we look at the seventies teams. They had some horrendous regular seasons, but Roger Nielsen, the late seventies. Those teams showed up, and they often upset teams in the playoffs. Uh, the Islander upset in '77 uh, with Lanny McDonald's overtime goal. You know that's a that's a perfect example of that. This team doesn't beat uh, the teams they should beat, and they don't show up in the clutch when they have the ability to impose their will, particularly on home ice. And for me, that's ultimately the 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 that's the the legacy of of this core. Mm -hmm. So, if you're a betting man, what are the odds of Sheldon Keith being the head coach next year? Yeah, talking about percentage wise, I yeah. think. Well below 50%. I think it's probably 35% realistically. Okay. What about um, Dubas rehired as GM? I say 65. What about Dubas replacing Shanahan as president? Um, probably 55. Okay. So it's so more like, like 50 50 ish. Okay. So Shanahan remaining as president? Uh well, 48 percent ish. So again, 50 50. Yeah. Regardless, there will finally be really deep change i think yeah and i'm all for it because if i have to watch the toronto sports network and sports net and all the talk shows and all the podcasts regarding the leafs mm -hmm. changing the script is very important it's yeah. important for the league because when Toronto is successful, it's just like when Montreal is successful, it's good for the league. 
Yeah. It may not translate into giant ratings in the States, but it really does make a difference in Canada. Yeah. And, you know, you could say that with the Oilers, you could say that with the Flames, you could say that with the Canucks, if they have deep runs. But the the point being is that the Leafs have the opportunity with the, what you see on paper, to be a champion. Mm -hmm. And they're not constructed to be a champion. And I think that at least we will see change. And I think for Leaf fans, that's all they can ask for. Yeah, just to like give a chance and give an opportunity with a proper clean proper slate. Another than a clean slate and to, to give these fans hope because mm-hmm. it's been way too long to go on recycling mode. And even in the 90s, when they got Cliff Fletcher and Pat Burns, it was just a, it's been a recurring uh, trend of it, of hits and misses. It just got to get more hits than misses. And look at what happened with the Toronto Rock. Like the last 30 years, ever since the Leafs won the Stanley Cup, they have, they have oversee the, the, uh, I mean, by Toronto sports fans, they saw Toronto Blue Jays won back to back. They want they have seen the Toronto Rock, which is one of the most underappreciated franchises in in pro sports in this country. If you really think about, it. they have had great promotions all around ever since they came to Hamilton. They have drawn up very good crowds, but mm-hmm. in the heyday in Toronto when they first started, they won like four or first five. Yep. And then you had the the Toronto FC and you got the Toronto Argonauts in the last few years too. And even the Raptors. And the Raptors as well, yeah. It, it's it, everything is going on good for for a sports fan in Toronto, but there will always be uh, the one constant when it comes to to understanding what Toronto sports is about, and that is the main beliefs. It's a hockey it, town. It's like a Montreal hockey town. It's a hockey town. Yeah. It's 55 years and counting, so they, they, they need to do a deep uh, soul searching. Montreal, barring change, I'm saying, Yeah, will win a Stanley Cup sooner than this current iteration of the Leafs, if you take the the roster and the front office. And the reason why I say that is that there's just simply just the way the team is constructed. At least you see consistent effort every night when the Habs lose by three goals. The odd night, they take off like every regular season team when they're losing. It happens. Yeah. But Toronto doesn't have guys on their roster that are being paid $10 million plus that scare anybody. No. And that's really that's the tragedy of what you're seeing right now. John yeah. Tavares is a great player. He deserves to get paid a lot of money. I don't know if you can argue that he deserves to get paid as much as he does now. Yeah. But you have to have guys that are willing to get dirty. Not necessarily be dirty, but compete. Mm -hmm. And Yari Curry competed more than Mitch Marner ever has in a day in his life on the on, on this leaf core. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I know it's two you know it's two different eras. But I remember what Yari Curry used to get. People used to criticize uh Yari Curry. He's only successful because he's playing with Gretzky. 
the amount of work and effort to get the puck, to move the puck, and to be original in what you're doing every shift. Yeah. And this is a big frustration I have watching the Leafs. They do that little drop pass, we're going to possess it, and then we're going to have a guy try to cut through two people. And they never get the pop back. Never. They're core guys, I mean, right? Yeah. If you can't forecheck in today's NHL with the speed that they play at, you cannot win. McDavid and Dreisaitl, when they don't have the puck, they can go into the opposing end and they can get the puck back. They may not, they may not be Pavel Datsuk in his prime, but at least during a given period, you're going to see one or two shifts where they get the puck and they start to cycle a bit and watch out. I didn't see Toronto cycle in the top two lines for like five games in the playoffs. I can't remember. Maybe maybe Tavares, uh, particularly mm. uh, in that overtime game, that shift, right? Everything else is just playing on the outside, even their power play. Tic-tac-toe on the outside, nobody driving to the net, nobody creating interference, nothing. And it's bad. Mm. Because I remember I remember uh in the in the two thousands, that team that went to the conference finals, they had Darcy Tucker, they had they had they had dudes that went full out all the time. And and you can't rely on your veterans, the grinders, to win it for you. But sure does help. Yeah. And and that's the tragedy of, of today's Leaf team. Um, because you know the, they blew it they blew it up in the early 2010s to get Matthews. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if Matthews will stay unless he's serious about signing an extension. But he has all the power right now. And it, like for me, if he doesn't sign in the next month, or he doesn't give them a number in which they're comfortable negotiating into the following season, mm-hmm. they're going to have to decide whether they move on Matthews or they move on Marner. Yeah. But I think it's one of those two guys. I think Nylander, I think Nylander is a, a well card in this. He's the easiest guy to move. And you want to keep Matthews, I think, if he's willing to stay. Yeah. But they've got to be very careful. Because a free agent, it's been talked about by a number of people, but the free agent pool for this year isn't that great. There is there isn't like a a, a top tier guy that's going to be a, a a difference maker really. So they they have to look to making a significant trade that changes things. Yeah, and if if it's not a, a top tier guy in terms of uh, the scoring list for next regular season, it has to be a chemistry guy for a playoff run. Mm -hmm. They have to do what Tampa did. Tampa went from winning the president's trophy, 60 plus win season against uh, Columbus and being swept in the first round. They, They went to the following season. They were sixth or seventh, as I recall, in the regular season. And they came back and they won the cup. Because, again, they changed the chemistry of the team. Mm. And and big part of it is the coaching. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. Any last, any last thoughts? 
And I just want to see the Leafs win the cup. It, it's, it's a long, way long overdue. And I understand the frustration by the fans of Leafs, Leafs Nation. But also, you cannot preach, uh, continue to preach uh, this current core unless it is a shakeup because you can't. You can't win with this team. The, this team cannot win with with this core the way it is. They they need to get more structure uh, with with their uh, roster, and probably convince their top the top uh, stars to go uh, to restructure the cap so they could get at least another guy or two to um, to go. But that may not seem likely. But yeah, it's just. The Leafs is going to have to be... Uh, Tavares would be the guy. Yeah. Tavares would be the guy that could make that commitment. I don't think Nylander is going to because he's yeah. going to he's going to go. Bar, barring the other two guys actually moving out, I think. But um, of the two... Marner's a Toronto boy, right? Yeah. He might be willing to uh, take a bit of a discount to stay, but I'd be skeptical. Mm -hmm. I I, personally, I don't like his attitude. Mm. From what happened, from what happened, the disappointment, he has to own the fact that they lost. And his and his contribution to that, yeah, he has to say the words, and the fact that he doesn't is a problem. I think Matthew said a lot more than I expected. I think you know just because he's in a holding pattern, and you know on a human level, I mean he you know he he's going into a big situation, and it's easy when you're holding all the cards to be to be a bit of a dick. Yeah. And I think he I think he's been respectful in 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 what he said the last day or two. However, yeah. um you know, again, I think I think Nylander's gone. I think it's either one of Matthews or, uh, or Marner and if it's if they have to make a decision, I think logically it has to be Marner. You know. Um, because they can get value for him because of his contract. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. If they trade Matthews, Matthews is going to have to agree to sign a deal with the with the uh, you know unless it's a sign and trade, which doesn't happen a lot in in the mm -hmm. NHL. But obviously, it's a problem. Yeah, and it's going to it's going to take a lot of um, soul searching, I think, for for the. We fan base because of all the disappointments that that obviously you guys have had. You know, like like Montreal had that glorious run, that improbable run, a couple of years ago, um, mm -hmm. that has taken a while to sting away for not even being in the in the running for years. But mm -hmm. um, you know, Tr Toronto is just in this situation. It's it's. You know, you don't want to blow the whole thing up, but you're oh. doing a controlled demolition of a pretty rotten wing yeah. of a structure. And so we'll see how that shapes up. So Absolutely. let's stop there. Thank you, Michael, for your time as always. Yeah, thank you for and having I, me. Bruce. And I'd like to thank all of you for watching. I hope you're entertained. And uh, if you would like to uh, like and subscribe uh, to the channel and, and to this podcast, uh, by all means. And we'll come back with more material uh, regarding the upcoming uh, conference finals and the Stanley Cup final, as well as other sports. So until Absolutely. next time, take care.